I'm happy to report that you have Nairobi Metropolitan Service here with us today to tell us about this story. So we'll be starting shortly. So I want uh, we'll be starting shortly. So I'll call out your name. You show us your you start your video, show us your face, say hi, and we 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 start. So Dr. Winnie Mwangi from Nakuru County. Yes, I'm here. This is Lois. Perfect, Can perfect. We, um, uh, Dr. Mbuvi, Kenyatta National Hospital. Yes, hello guys, how are you? Thank you. Dr. Ndusi from Machakos County. Hi, everyone. Perfect. Dr. Mumbua, mm -hmm. Kiambu County. Hi everyone, good morning. Thank you so much. Dr. Sood, Mombasa County. Uh, morning everyone. Dr. Zaituni, Transoya County. Morning everybody. Dr. Yvette, Transoya County. Good morning everyone. Perfect. Do, uh, Dr. Jobo Kemo, Trukana. Good morning, everyone. Dr. Thomas Ogaron, Nairobi Metropolitan Service. Dr. Ogaro. Yes, yeah, my name is Dr. Thomas Ogaro, Nairobi Metropolitan Services. Perfect. Uh, Dr. Mary Beth Maritim. Uh, good morning, everybody. And our boss, Dr. Lois Achim. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's session. Thank you so much. So, uh, Dr. Dr. Rola Kalando, my co panelist. Good morning, Good morning, everyone. Perfect. So, as we start, Lois, start us off. I'm putting up my slides. Just one second. Sorry, I'm just uh, getting my slides and I'll be starting in a second. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for logging in today. Um, we have quite a rich panel of uh, presenters from several counties. Thank you all panelists for joining us and the willingness to share your experiences. Uh, each county will have just about five minutes to present where they are in terms of preparedness, as well as any specific questions they may have, especially as relates to the severely ill patients. Uh, then we'll finish with by answering many of the questions that have come in. Um, so just allow me to share my screen. I, I hope you can see my screen. So um, just talking about where we are now and maybe some important questions that have come to us. This will just be brief, just to try and highlight some of the important uh, issues that are coming up. So if we look globally, and this is from something, a website called Our World in Data, which has excellent graphics, uh, graphical representation of where we are and where several countries are. And this one is sort of looking at the daily positivity rate, um, giving sort of a seven day rolling average. And you can see that there are countries that have a positivity rate of up to 50%, like many of the South American countries. Uh, practically, um, they test 1,000 and 500 will be positive, and that's really crazy. Uh, we think that largely in South American countries, South Africa is quickly reaching there, um, part of Mexico and part of you know, um, South America has had quite a bit of uh, problems there. Then we have the next section, which has a positivity rate of about 10 to 20 percent. And unfortunately, over the last week or so, we've seen Kenya reach there with some days having up to a 15 percent positivity rate. Um, what does this actually mean? One, it may mean that we are really 
targeting the population that is likely to be positive. So for example, we may only be targeting people who have symptoms, but that's not necessarily true for Kenya. We still have a lot of testing of track workers. We still have a lot of companies requesting to test their people just because, uh, but we also have people who may not necessarily be contacts but are, pre are presenting for testing. So, but this means that a one will have a lot of community transmission because you have, you know, you may need to test just a one in nine or 10 people to get a positive case. So if you have that many people out in the community, then you have a lot of community transmission. So that is something for us to be concerned about. I was actually fairly shocked to see Australia's positivity rate. You know, Australia has been imposing significant lockdowns over the last week, but their positivity rate is still quite low. But where we are now, we really need to emphasize to people the issue about wearing masks and positive and um, avoiding all manner of public gatherings because chances that you'll meet someone who's positive are high. Uh, if we look at the national data as summarized by the EOC, the Emergency Response, Emergency Operations Center, we can see that we are sort of just in an exponential phase of rise and we're nowhere near peaking. We probably will peak in the next two or three months. Um, different modelers have suggested that our peak may be, you know, end of September, October into November. But again, how soon we peak will depend on what people do. If we encourage a lot of public gatherings and people don't have their masks, then we may have this peak coming sooner with very high cases. And the risk of having a peak coming sooner with a lot of cases is that you also have a lot of people requiring hospitalization, a lot of people we are not able to take care of and increase mortality. So trying to slow that peak so that we are not too overwhelmed and our health facilities are not too overwhelmed is important. So it's everybody's everybody's business to talk about, you know, flattening this curve or slowing the rate of rise. But we really have to talk to people about wearing their masks. Uh, today I was listening to the news on BBC and they're talking about how the UK is now making mask wearing mandatory. And I thought, oh, wasn't this already being done? But apparently now is when they're making mask wearing mandatory and we really have to think about our country and how to ensure that people wear masks and wear them correctly. So with 15,000 confirmed cases so far, and just about 263 deaths. And I think this last week we've seen days where we reported a higher number of deaths than we've seen before. In terms of counties, I think now almost every county has a case. And for the counties that have not reported cases, we really need to think about surveillance so that we pick the first cases and isolate to reduce the rate of spread in the community. So different counties may sort of have different uh, strategies. So for Nairobi, right now, we really need to encourage people about mask wearing, about avoiding public gatherings. For counties that have very few cases, we really need to do very good contact tracing and isolation and quarantine so that we contain it at a very early stage. For counties that have no cases yet, we need to do very good surveillance so that we pick the initial cases. Uh, this is sort of highlighting um, the number of tests that have been done week on week and the number that were symptomatic and those that were symptomatic. Again, uh, from the community and at the point of testing, we have just about uh, close to 90% of all those who are tested being asymptomatic. But because the numbers are so large, the hospitals are seeing a lot of the symptomatic patients. Uh, looking at the mortalities, our current mortality rate is just about 1.7 to 1.8%, which again is very, very high. Uh, it may be because um, we are not doing broad testing. If we tested several people and we had a lot of asymptomatic people, we may have a lower mortality rate. But to the mortality rate of 1 point something percent, it's particularly high. And we really have to think about reducing spread, about protecting the vulnerable populations so that we reduce those who are at risk of severe disease and at risk of severe outcomes. Uh, this, I present this every single week and it's really just looking at, um, you know, now that there's been a lot of travel and many of the restrictions are not there, what will happen to each of the counties? And we can see that the numbers needed in hospitals, so hospitalization numbers, 
will really be dependent on what the counties do in terms of reducing contacts between people and encouraging people to wear masks and avoid all public gatherings. Uh, so for example, right now, if you assumed that uh, the percentage of contacts has gone up by 60%, for example, it means that at peak, maybe somewhere around end of October to November, Nairobi will require about 3,000, close to 4,000 hospital beds. And today we'll hear from NMS how many of those they've already started preparing, because this will come sooner than we expect. So in another two or three months, we are going to require close to 4,000 hospital beds. If you look at Kiambu, 2,600 beds is the projected need at time of peak. And this is assuming that we've increased contacts from the fully mitigated uh, situation by about 60%. So every county can begin to think, what do I have in place? The 300 figure that have been given out was really a bare minimum to start off. But if you achieve 300, don't now sit back and think I already have the 300. You need to think of increasing that capacity for the counties that are likely to have higher numbers and also ensuring that you have oxygen supply. As we said, this is uh, cases requiring hospitalization, not total cases. So many of these patients may actually require oxygen. Our experience so far is that close to a third of the patients we're admitting now require oxygen. So it's not just about having the bed, it's about ensuring you have um, the capacity to nurse sick patients, there's oxygen, and you have healthcare personnel. I think many of the counties have struggled with critical care because they just did not have personnel. But also that you have adequate PPE and training of this personnel so that you're not using your health workforce to isolation and quarantine. In terms of treatment, and this is a common question that has come this week, especially because we've seen a lot of companies trying to sell various drugs. This, um, you can look at uh, something like this, it's actually in the New York Times, and they've been tracking any new treatments coming, which is very interesting uh, because they have very good data on that side. So in terms of what treatments are useful, and here we look at patients who are uh, very sick. Remember the patients who have mild symptoms or who are not sick often will not require treatment, maybe some symptomatic relief. Uh, in terms of the patients who are sick, the widely used treatments, I think we've talked about this in the last um, webinar, are things like prone positioning for patients who are struggling to breathe or who require oxygen to try and increase oxygenation and also ventilation for those patients who you are totally unable to ensure adequate oxygenation with high flow oxygen. Then there's some with promising evidence. And uh, promising evidence, this is where we have uh, drugs like remdesivir and uh, dexamethasone. So for dexamethasone, I think we talked about the recovery trial last week that showed um, good outcomes in patients who, have, um, who, ha who are, require oxygen or who require ventilation and not in normal patients. Some people are beginning to stock up on dexamethasone. We need to be able to educate people appropriately. Uh, remdesivir is one of those where we're still waiting for further outcomes. The initial trials showed that it reduced the duration of Ill, illness, so to speak, uh, by maybe three or so days, but there was no data to show that it reduced mortality. So again, clinical trials are still needed to determine its effect on mortality and the actual effect on improving certain outcomes like need for ventilation. Uh, we'll probably be starting the solidarity trial soon in the next few weeks and we'll be looking at remdesivir. Then there are some that are tentative or mixed evidence. We still are not clear. And this is where drugs like favipiravir would fall in. Uh, there may be some data showing some effect, but it's still very preliminary and we shouldn't be using any of these drugs unless it is in the context of a clinical trial. Then there are those that are not promising at all and we shouldn't use them. And these are hydroxychloroquine and lopinavir ritonavir. Then there's some that are just pseudoscience or fraud. And uh, I might just say maybe COVID organics might fall under this, <laughs> this category. So maybe we shouldn't import any into the country. But it's important to keep abreast with this because one patient will ask, uh, of late, we've seen a lot of companies coming in, oh, we want to launch, um, want to launch remdesivir, we want to launch uh, favipiravir, and the rest. It's important to have the data and know what category of patients you're using. And if it's a drug that's not licensed, then it needs to be used in the context of a clinical trial, and it needs to be reported to the Poisons and Pharmacy Board. 
the other thing I want to talk about is antibiotics. And the reason for this is because we see a lot of patients who are being managed for COVID are also on antibiotics. And there's been the question of how do we ensure adequate antimicrobial stewardship in the era of um, uh, COVID. I was asked to do a presentation during the launch of the National MS guidelines and included a few of these slides then. So one, it's important to recognize that sometimes we can miss serious, not just bacterial, but several other infections when we only focus on COVID. So someone could come with malaria and fever, and we only think about, oh, we're waiting for a COVID test and not um, treat the patient appropriately. So it's important that we consider that other things can cause fever. So even as we wait for two or three or four or five days for this COVID result to come, uh, clinical acumen is important. We need to take proper history to uh, examine patients appropriately and investigate accordingly so that we do not lose patients to preventable causes. The other thing is that even as you start uh, a patient, let's say you think this patient may have a community acquired pneumonia, I still do not have results and I'm waiting for certain information. Then as soon as you have further information, then you need to stop the antibiotics. Let's say you didn't have any lab results and now you have a chest x-ray that doesn't show pneumonia and you have blood counts that don't show any rise in white cell count and really there's no reason for you to suspect a pneumonia, then you need to stop that antibiotic uh, and not just continue. Also, duration should be as short as possible as per guidance. So let's say I started a patient on treatment for pneumonia. I should treat that patient for five days and not continue for 14 days. If a patient was started on any IV medication, then there should be a switch to oral therapy soon. And then if we think about some of the tests, remember COVID-19 is a viral infection. The CRP is usually raised and doesn't necessarily predict a bacterial infection. And early data from some of the sites that are managed significant number of patients seems to suggest that bacterial infections, secondary bacterial infections are maybe uncommon. Um, so some of the suggestions that may help, if someone has no purulent sputum and no evidence of an pneumonia, do not prescribe antibiotics. If they have evidence of a pneumonia and purulent sputum and they're thinking this is a community acquired pneumonia with a low carb score, uh, then amoxicillin for five days. If it's a pneumonia that's of healthcare onset, then we really need to think about what are the institutional guidelines for managing a hospital acquired pneumonia. Uh, and the same applies if you're managing a ventilator acquired pneumonia. Um, it's important to remember that antibiotics will have unintended consequences, including toxicity. And this may be most prevalent in elderly patients who may also be at highest risk for severe outcomes of infections. So it's always important to discuss and balance and weigh what you give versus any harm that may come out of the drugs we give. And we just mentioned the issue of antivirals and the evidence that's there for some of the antiviral agents. I will stop there. Thank you very much. We'll take any questions at the end. And now uh, allow me to invite Dr. Ogaro from Nairobi Metropolitan Services. Dr. Ogaro, are you there? Dr. Ogaro? Yes, I am there. Karibu sana. Thank, thank you so much. You, I don't know. Good morning, you, everyone. Good morning, Dr. Ogaro. You want me to give my presentation now? You can present your slides. You can share screen at the bottom there so that you're able to see your slides and you can go ahead. Uh, are you able to see my slides? Uh, not yet. Have you shared the screen? Yes, share screen. That's the screen. Those are my, are you seeing that? Mm, not yet. Can you see slides? Are you seeing some slides on the screen? Mm, not yet, Dr. Ogaro. Why is it not coming? There's a PowerPoint presentation there. Are you seeing anything on the screen? Not yet. What you can do, yes. uh, we can ask someone to present before you and you email yes. us the slides and we'll be able to uh, display them for you. All right, thanks. Okay, so Dr. Sood, are you there? Hi, Lois. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Hi. Okay, please go ahead. Hi. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, 
the current situation this morning, actually, we have 21 patients. Two are severe cases. We have um, 11 males, 10 females, and we have 10 suspected cases. Uh, we have also increased our home-based care to 115, but this is cumulative from last week. And I'll just show you how the home-based care patients demography is. We have 54 females and 61 males. And out of this, we are still continuing with our testing. I know last week we said uh, we can leave them at home, but unfortunately when we engage these patients, we realize actually the psychological aspect of just telling them to sit at home and after 14 days you are negative, doesn't go well with them. So we follow them up and we have 78 of them who have uh, turned negative and uh, 18 of them we are waiting for their repeat results and 15 not yet tested, but everyone is happy from these results. Uh, when we look at the transmission, as you correctly said in your presentation, now we are seeing a lot of local transmission, which has reduced in comparison when you look at it uh, during end of May, June. And this is actually true when you look at every week, cumulatively, the number of cases we have been having, and currently they are actually going uh, downwards, the positive cases. And this is also showing you the same pictorial of how we are moving uh, a little bit lower than expected. And uh, one of the things I thought I should bring back again is <clears throat> the healthcare workers and uh, positivity of healthcare workers. And you can tell that there was a time where people had actually put their shields down. And now we are seeing less of infections uh, in healthcare workers, which we have done this by sensitizing them. We have started redoing again the trainings to ensure that everyone is fit uh, back like this week. I'm currently from just uh, doing one of the trainings again on PPE and everything so that people get to know how to, to gown properly donning and doffing and we do not assume that everyone now is perfect. Uh, if you look at the healthcare worker affected, we have a whole range of everyone from surgeons, paramedic, nurses, uh, uh, nutritionists. And <clears throat> this is what we are saying that a lot of people need to take precautions now, especially that numbers are escalating. And though ours are on the lower side, but we still need to prepare ourselves because it is at community level. Uh, a lot of patients are still asymptomatic. You can see we have almost 90% of our patients are asymptomatic and 9.9% is uh, patients with symptoms. Uh, I thought we should put this so that you can know that a lot of our patients who come in present with cough, fever, and difficulty in breathing, but the comorbidity you can see in all the months is hypertension is the one which is leading, followed by diabetes. And then we have heart problems also there. And some of these are other heart uh, comorbidities like CKD and the rest. So we need to pay attention to these two categories when you are dealing with these patients because they do deteriorate very fast. Uh, challenges, of course, it is just overwhelmed by healthcare workers and human resource. We need more people. There is difficulty in tracking confirmed cases due to wrong phone numbers and incomplete forms. Some are uh, names which are given are wrong. Uh, the NHIF still remains a big issue for healthcare workers, and this is a question we get prompted every now and then what is happening with our NHIF. So I hope it will be solved. And uh, how do we slow down this transmission? And I've always believed if you follow these three T's, you test, trace, and treat, you can actually achieve uh, a better outcome in this uh, patient. So I would want to stop there, Lois. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Sood. Uh, I guess uh, one of the questions we'd have is, what's your experience now with your critically ill patients? Do you have a lot of critically ill patients? Yeah, so currently we have uh, three patients in uh, ICU. Uh, one has been with us now for the last uh, four weeks and uh, two are newly diagnosed. Uh, one was referred from uh, Malindi and without even communication just landed in our area. 
luckily we had an ICU space for her. So uh, we have three critically, but what I can tell you is from yesterday, we are seeing in the private hospital, they are receiving very uh, critical uh, patients and uh, we are on the watch to see what is coming. Okay. And uh, what sort of what percentage of your COVID beds are currently occupied? Uh, so our facility uh, has 150. So we have only occupied uh, 20. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. We'll send you some of ours, don't worry. We just need an express train to, to Coast General. Okay, thank you so thank much, you. Dr. Sid. We appreciate the work that you're doing there, the excellent Thanks. work that you're doing there. Okay, thank you. So now allow me to invite Dr. Ogaro. I think we have your slides, Dr. Ogaro. Dr. Ogaro? Hospital. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Garo, we're still waiting for you. So meanwhile, Dr. Winnie Mwangi from Nakuru, please go ahead and present. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, Winnie, we can hear you. Can share your slides? Yes, about you, one second. Um, so, unfortunately, Dr. Wainaina could not be here this morning. We're conducting a training. Um, so, I will be speaking on behalf of him. He sends his regards. I hope you can see the slides. Uh, yes, we can. All right. Yeah. So, um, it's my first time presenting this forum, but I'm a frequent member. So, I'm Dr. Winnie Mwangi. I'm an anesthesiologist and a critical care physician in a career level five. Um, our current <clears throat> standing as of yesterday <clears throat> is <clears throat> the ultra and ladder is going to be where we are at. I wanted to deviate a bit towards critical care because I've realized we have had an incident, a couple of instances actually, just as um, Coast was presenting in terms of we're really getting the private care spilling over into the public in terms of care and we're getting critical patients and I feel that I do not, I'm not sure that we're all adequately prepared or mentally even prepared in terms of what critical care is going to entail. So I will do a trajectory towards that way in my presentation. So right now, so far in crew, we've tested 6,240 cases of which 240 are confirmed. Of those seven are healthcare workers. As of yesterday, we have seven new cases. Um, total admissions are 47 of which 20 are currently in PGH. Home-based care, we have 59 cases of which 24 have been discharged from care and 35 are still ongoing. 61 have recovered and we've had five deaths of which two have been in PGH. So you have to look at your resources when you're thinking in terms of critical care, um, both from central government, county government, other institutions. So for Nakuru, we have the benefit of having Egerton on board and other donors that you might need. Um, so one thing, your ICU literally has to be as accessible as possible. So for our isolation units, we actually have the ICU for COVID right in the middle of um, our isolation unit. So moving, movement of patient is about 100 meters from the ward to the ICU. You need to make sure that you have adequate um, points for your suction, your monitor, your ventilator. Um, your oxygen supply must be there, your medical air and vacuum. These patients usually have comorbids, as um, Dr. Mohamed has said. Uh, so you need to be able to dialyze these patients. You don't want to move them a lot. Um, you want to avoid contact, of course, with your hands. So try and make sure everything else is, you know, operated by any other means. And make sure they can access any form of disposal in at least half of the places you're going to have your patients in. So the basics, um, I'm really hoping to address people who are in remote areas like myself. Nakuru may not seem remote, but in a way it is. So you must have some basic things that when people are coming to you and saying, do you have an ICU bed? An ICU bed is not just a bed. It comes with a lot of things. So you must have what I call minimum equipment. Your beds, your ripple mattress, your syringe pump, infusion pumps, 
Your ventilators must be compatible and something you're conversant with. Your dialysis machines may be, must be available and working. Your monitors must actually be able to give you both invasive and non-invasive. Um, the criteria we're using in Nakuru in terms of ICU admission is um, tachypnea of above 30, PF ratio of 150 and below, uh, saturations below 90% despite 15 liters along with self-proning. So you must have also a blood gas machine, if possible, at least a PGH we have currently. Um, it stopped working last week, but we're hoping to get it back on board. Um, it's a thrombotic, it's a microthrombotic um, condition. So um, you cannot really be, you're going to give clexane in therapeutic doses, but at the same time, it helps if you have pneumatic compression uh, stockings. If possible, the problem with COVID is once something is dedicated to a patient or using a patient, once it goes in, it doesn't come out. I.e., if you're going to have an ultrasound machine and you use it on a COVID patient, it becomes a COVID committed um, machine in that case. So try and see what you can do in your situation. Um, try and avoid as much movement as you come. So for us, we have an ultrasound machine is not COVID dedicated, but some probes are COVID dedicated. Um, when you're going in for an intubation, and I feel this is something that we're missing a lot. We lost a patient a couple of nights ago, um, and it was due to preparedness in terms of when you're going into a patient's room. You must be completely ready before you go into a patient's room. It's not emergent if they're going to a bradycardia for you to rush in there if you have not done it properly. If you're planning to go and intubate that patient, you must make sure all your drugs are drawn and labeled. You've checked your tubes, if the cuffs are working, you've checked your laryngoscopes. You've made sure you have introducers or stylus, whatever you may need. You have your emergency drugs also ready. The ventilator has been checked and confirmed. Your suction is working. Everything must be done outside. Um, I, I feel like I may be flogging a dead horse, but I cannot offer emphasize in the fact that the team going in has to be a minimum of three people. One who's airway proficient and one who's also airway proficient, but not necessarily the best person. And a third person, and you must have a runner outside who is not doing other things. They are going to sit there waiting for your signal in case you need anything else. Because once you go in, there's no coming out until that patient is sorted. So when you go in, aim to intubate, put your central line, put your arterial line, put your urinary catheter, put your NG tube. Every single thing that needs to be done to that patient is done in that initial entry. So that's why you have to make sure the things I've just listed um, as follows, that they're done ahead of time. Um, try and make sure that you have an entire ICU bed in quotes in terms of whatever you will need for an ICU patient extra, a whole set extra in case it happens. Our scenario happened that the patient was atypical in terms of COVID. They did not have a fever. They were not having the obvious cough, um, but they were a cardiac patient with hypertension, suspected MI. Uh, so they had the chest pain, um, they had the diaphoresis, and the test was done on Monday. We received the patient on Monday night towards Tuesday morning. The results came back now on the Wednesday night. So by then they'd been with us for two, almost three nights. Um, a lot of stuff had been exposed, obviously. The patient had been on non rebreather. So you have to be ready for a COVID patient in terms of ICU care. Because then at that point in time, when you convert to them now being a COVID patient, you're ready to go and you know you go and get in that. So staffing is quite an issue, uh, which is understandable, especially because the psychological aspect of it, knowing you've been nursing a patient for two days straight, and then you find that they're COVID and you've been going home to your friends, your family, your relatives, there must be a senior consultant on board for you to do a critical care patient. That is non-negotiable. Um, in teaching institutions, for us, we have the advantage of having Cosexa. Kenyatta has the advantage of having University of Nairobi. You have registrars and fellows who are going to assist you. You have your um, senior house officers and you have your residents as well and your basic medical officers. So they need, you need to have adequate staffing in terms of how you're going to manage a patient. Critical care, you cannot manage a patient alone ever. Don't even attempt, don't even think it's an option. So for nursing, you'll find that you have what you call fixed establishment. Those are the ones who are usually nurses in charge. 
they're more experienced in terms of critical care, but they tend to do the official duties for lack of a better word. But we're also still training um, nurses in terms of critical care. So in terms of trained vis-a-vis -vis and trained, we prefer to have at least more trained than untrained because critical care patients are not the same as ward patients. You have to be way more vigilant with them. Um, from my experience so far in Okoro, I have found that small negligence in terms of hours can take a patient from one point to another point in terms of their ASA score or in terms of their RAS score or in terms of their CPOT score. Um, then in the terms of required staff, of course, there's a hierarchy that you have to keep in mind. So if you're in a remote area where you're being pushed to open an ICU or you're being told, we, you know, we have provided you with a building and we have bought these beds, all of this has to be considered. Um, uh, and I think the team has my number in case of any queries and of course I have senior consultants you can call. But you must be ready from the beginning to the end. Let's not assume just because there's a structure and there, uh, there are products or items or consumables, human resource is key when it comes to critical care management of COVID patients. So what I've discovered for our setting so far that we're having a problem with in terms of COVID is we do not have close suctioning. And we all know aerosolizing is the biggest way that COVID has been spread to our healthcare workers. Um, for Nakuru, we do not have negative pressure rooms, but we have the advantage of having an extractor fan in our ICU, which is a four bed capacity ICU. Um, PPEs, it's neither here nor there. You can have a good day where you have plenty, then you can have a bad day where you're scrambling and only so many people can go and see the patient. Um, like I said, with our blood gas machine, it will be working this month, not working the next few days, then it's back on. So consistency is key. Um, the testing of patients, we find that uh, for critical care here, we're trying to make sure that any patient who's admitted into our ICU, the main ICU, putting aside the COVID ICU, they're actually tested, but the tests take time coming back. So you can find a patient who came in with polytrauma, head injury, GCS was low, they ended up in ICU post-surgery. Then three days later, you're finding out they're COVID, but in those three days, how many people have seen, examined, been exposed to that patient? So that is also proving to be a bit dicey. Um, and then, of course, staff training and organization. We've been trying to make sure that our staff are trained, especially when it comes to donning and doffing, but they tend to forget. So we might need to consider retraining. Just because they've gone through one set of training, it does not mean they're going to remember it because they're not doing it constantly. So training and organization of staff needs to be a little bit more vigilant, and I would suggest a little bit more frequent, like refresher courses. So thank you, and I will take your questions at the end. Uh, thank you very much, Doc, for that excellent presentation. I think uh, for every hospital trying to set up um, to prepare for ICU, that's a very good guide. I'm just wondering how much of that do you actually have, have available in Nakuru? What are you actually doing in Nakuru? What do you have available? How many ICU beds? What is the bed occupancy currently? So um, for Nakuru, our ICU, our normal ICU is actually six beds. Mm -hmm. But we had already dedicated our isolation area, which has a capacity for four beds. I'm using the word capacity because if right now I was told to admit a COVID patient, I can only admit one patient. Oh. We have um, provision, for an, that, and that's what I was emphasizing, an ICU bed is not just a bed. Mm -hmm. That place has four beds, yes. We have two ventilators, yes. But in terms of staffing, in terms of the consumables, we can sufficiently look after one patient right now in terms of the COVID. However, due to this case we had a couple of days ago, our main ICU was now exposed to that patient because they were just on a non rebreather they were not intubated. Um, the capacity we can do with that one, we have the six beds for that ICU, but we can open our HDU, which can also accommodate an extra four. So in totality, in terms of critical care patients, we can safely take care of 14 patients. Mm -hmm. But in terms of COVID patients, we want to err on the safe side and say we can sufficiently look after four at most six COVID patients. Wow, okay. Clearly so there's need, mm -hmm. there's significant need to expand because Nakuru is yes. going to have a high number of yes. patients requiring yes. hospitalization and a high yes. number of patients requiring ICU care. 
Um, remember, Nakuru is fairly popular. So you have a high proportion of elderly people and comorbidities. So there needs to be a lot of thought around how you manage uh, um, right. two months from now when you have more patients. Um, and what in, in the general COVID ward, uh, what is um, your percentage occupancy currently? So we have the, I want to call it an advantage mm -hmm. um, in the sense of we are really trying to shunt asymptomatic patients out of PGH itself. Mm -hmm. um, we prefer having, okay, not by choice, but we prefer having the symptomatic ones closer to ICU care, if God forbid it goes that way. So Langa Langa is taking quite a few of our patients. So currently in PGH, we have 20. The capacity can go to 25 if we push it. And of those 20, only two are on oxygen and they're on minimal than about two to three liters. And they're doing really well. They've actually been weaned off the oxygen. Okay. So it's more asymptomatic than actually having symptomatic patients. We're really mm -hmm. trying to push for home-based care um, to avail the space. The one thing I have to say, of the five deaths that um, I shared earlier, and I said the two which were in occur, one of them was one that happened two days ago. The other one was actually a referral from a private hospital. Mm -hmm. So the private hospitals now are getting extra nervous and mm -hmm. they're seeing what they're going to get hit. And I think Dr. Mohammed can relate on this in terms of cost. Um, so we're going to get an influx of everyone mm -hmm. saying, oh, you're COVID, go to PGH. But, oh, yes, that, that's, true. Mm -hmm. that's so true. That's well, true, Doc. And, mm -hmm. So what we're doing in the core, we've decided um, at the end of the day, uh, if you have a patient, you're mandated, not just by your Hippocratic oath, but also as a facility to look after your patient. Uh, okay. So if you get a patient, if they come in, let's say with a fracture femur, and you're doing COVID as a routine test for any patient going in for an elective surgery, if they turn COVID positive, you're not going to send that patient to PGH. Okay, Doc. Sorry, I'm going to have to stop you because you have about 10 other facilities waiting oh, right. to present. Okay, but, anyway, but I think, happy I'll be here. yes, yes. Sorry. I think you raise an important point around working with the private facilities. Yes. Yes. Remember, even as you encourage private facilities to take care of their own patients, remember yes. sometimes it's better to centralize care rather than scatter one COVID patient in this hospital, one yes. in another one, one in another one, because it takes up a lot of resources. I agree. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Now allow Thank me to invite Dr. Garo. We have your slides on the screen. Please go ahead, Dr. Garo. Dr. Garo, are you unmuted? We can't hear you. Yes, yes, yes. Now I'm available. You can hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Thank, thank you very much. I have been having issues about internet. You know, Nairobi has the bulk of the disease. And uh, of course, more than 50% of the cases are in Nairobi. That's a dashboard which uh, was updated up to yesterday. I have not been able to update today's uh, dashboard. But if you look at my right-hand corner, you can see the epic curve, how it's going. But uh, let's go to the next slide. This one may not tell us so much, but uh, you can have it, we'll see it later. Let's go to the next, because time is not available. Yes, just a summary of what's happening in Nairobi. I think uh, by yesterday, we had 9,150 cases, giving a uh, an attack rate of 208, a very high attack rate, and uh, we are worried what's, what's happening. I have our case fatality rate is not so bad, 1.6%. But if you look at Blair 3, we have 280 frontline health workers who have been infected. This one, most of them are actually at home isolation, and we are closely monitoring them. The most affected facility was our big Pumuan maternity hospital, almost uh, 80. Healthcare workers were affected. Uh, fortunately, all of them are uh, under home based care, and the, most of them didn't have symptoms. Now, that is the, our graph. You can see our curve where it's going. It's quite exponential, and uh, we, we don't know where we'll go. But uh, God forbid, we, we don't go to the the other countries way. But look at most of our cases are basically community transmission. Community transmission in that uh, place like Kibera, 
like uh, Kawangware, the Eastlands, most, most of our cases are located there. And unfortunately, we are not able to pick the cases from the communities. And that's very much worrying. Initially, we started even uh, quarantine contacts, but contacts are seen in the communities, including the cases. That's why the spread is so rampant, and uh, we are basically worried. Next. Next slide. Just go to the next slide. Yes, look at the description of age and sex. Look at the age that is affected. This is the most active group. This one tells you that uh, this disease is basically transmitted depending on the behavior of our people. Males are more affected, females are more affected, and you can imagine how these people behave. It's quite a big number. Those are community deaths. Up to date from 1st July, when we started reporting community deaths, we have recorded 40 community deaths confirmed, suspected, because some of them are tested positive. We have nowhere to place them, and they actually die at home. Those are disputed cases according to the I think you have gone back. Go to the next slide. Go to the next slide. Next slide, Ranul. Hello? Yeah. Go to the next slide. That's what I've explained. Age, sex, revision. Uh, we're already on the next slide. Um, yeah, the one that's on looking at the different uh, sub-counties. Yes, now that's a, the that's a correct slide. You can see the leading sub-county. This is it. Basically, the cases that were announced yesterday, and it's the same everywhere. Kibra is leading with 64 cases, followed by, Langa, followed by Kasarani. Those are the Eastlands. Remember, Langata and Kibra, they are together. When you go to Westlands, Westlands is because you know most of our laboratories are found in Westlands, and there are also some slum areas there. If you look at Embakas East, that's where the Utawala side, Mukuru side, Embakas South, Mukuru side. So you can see the situation of the cases in terms of uh, sub counties in Nairobi. Kibra is leading, that's where Kibra is. And you can imagine these people cannot, one, social distancing is, is, is unheard of. Two, if you don't get out these cases, you can imagine what the reproduction rate, what will happen. Next. These were just yesterday's cases. Next slide, please. Next slide. We're Hello? already on the next slide. I think it's a little slow on your end. Am I audible? Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Yes, yes. Well, uh, this was basically, yes, this basically tells you about the testing rate. Okay, you moved, but I was talking of the testing rate. Our positivity rate is almost 13 percent. But let me mention what we are doing. Targeted testing for both case finding and surveillance. You remember Nairobi is the epicenter, we are testing those people who exhibit symptoms suggestive of COVID-19. We are also testing people willing to be tested, especially corporate, public servants all over. We also investigate any alert we get from our calls. We identify the positive cases. The only problem is that, of course, we have facility-based care. We have home-based care. The only problem with the home-based care is that uh, these people who are, who are home-based care it's not that the homes where they are is ideal for home based care. It's only because we have nowhere to take them. We are doing contact tracing. Even if we don't do contact tracing, following them, we don't have a place to quarantine them. So we advise them to quarantine them, that, them at home. Hopefully that they'll be able to practice what we tell them to do. But otherwise, it's quite difficult to quarantine at home, especially in, a, in the informal settlement where most cases are. Currently, the only people who are quarantined are those people who come from outside. Remember, we still have uh, flights coming from uh, abroad. Some people, some, 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 some flights are chartered. Some flights are those people who are stranded in abroad, so they are coming back. Those who are tested and they come a PCR negative test, those ones will allow the home quarantine. But those ones who don't have a PCR test, we take them to mandatory quarantine. And the current mandatory quarantine is KMTC, St. George's, uh, and other public facilities, those who can afford, they go to the private hotels, which were, which were, initially, uh, which were initially taken as quarantine sites. Enforcement of public health measures, this is what we are trying to tell people to do, but 
you can see from the media you have seen people being caught in the in the in the, in the bus bring whatever now we are bought ambulances basically for referral uh, god forbid we don't even know where to refer them from but we can be able to get them out of the community we are trying to build an a makeshift hostel at the Mbagadi. on your left side that's a, an on the way makeshift photo at the Bagat hostel which which will take about 160 beds next I, I know you are asking me what we will be able to do about uh, the next steps. Other than the Bagadi makes it also that we are trying to build, we have proposed a few schools to be basically like isolation sites because instead of leaving the community, the people in the communities, we can at least take them out of the community and place them elsewhere. We isolate from the communities. So we are planning some major schools in Nairobi. We have requested Ministry of Education to allow us to use those facilities as isolation sites. These are the major challenges. Widespread community transmission, most informal settlement, where home isolation and home quarantine is not possible. So, so many cases are still in the community, can, they cannot be uh, taken out of the community because of those issues. We don't have a solution site. Currently, we only depend on uh, KU and uh, KNH as public facilities for isolation and treatment centers, which in most cases are basically full. So we can't even access them. So as I've said, most cases are in the community. Uh, the contacts who cannot be able to go to quarantine, they can't even quarantine them, themselves at home. Now, most important is that uh, all those cases we hear being announced in Nairobi, almost 30 percent, they are actually not from Nairobi. They are from Kiambu, Machakos, and even some others outside Kiambu and Machakos. The unfortunate thing, and this one will warn about the other counties outside Nairobi, sometimes when results came, come, we try to contact the index case. Somebody tells us I've already gone to Kisumu, I've already gone to Kakamega, I'm already in Embu. So it becomes a very dangerous scenario. And this one I think uh, needs to be noted. Otherwise, uh, the opening of Nairobi will make things worse, especially the outside counties. Uh, thank you. I, I think I'm through. I'll, I'll welcome any question because there are so many things I can say. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ogaro, for that uh, insightful presentation on the uh, uh, COVID response within the Nairobi uh, Metropolitan uh, Services and the Greater Metropolitan uh, Area. So I think uh, this is a very timely presentation because every day when the numbers are announced, it's Nairobi that takes the lion's share of those numbers. And it's uh, saddening to know that most of those numbers are actually in the community, particularly in the informal settlement where we know. Uh, the settings are not optimal and probably is fueling, uh, the, it's like adding fuel to the fire and fueling the outbreak. I just had a few questions to ask uh, regarding uh, the approach because each county was given like a sort of a minimum requirements to prepare. And we've heard a bit about your epidemic, more about the epidemiology, but I just had specific things that maybe you can address as you take the questions. One of the things I wanted to find out is uh, uh, what, what, do you have a hotline number that many of the audience are listening in actually are from Nairobi? Is there a hotline number that they can call when they have a last to be investigated? Uh, to what extent is the risk communication and community engagement happening in the informal sector to reduce the settings, particularly because you said that 40, there have been 40 deaths within the community. Uh, okay, and then the other... 44 deaths within, that's even higher than what I had written down, 44 deaths. How are we enforcing the public health measures at the community level within the informal settings? And then the biggest question is, where do people go for lab testing in the Nairobi metropolitan if they have symptoms and they do not have 5,000 shillings? Where can they actually present themselves for testing? And then how many beds currently do you have for case management that are not within KU and KNH? Uh, that's under case management, and you've clearly addressed the infection prevention. But the biggest question for the healthcare workers protection, the healthcare workers in the uh, facilities within the greater Nairobi metropolitan, do they have adequate PPE? Those are just a few questions that I'd written down to ask, which we've been actually asking all the counties to present to us in a specific format. But because you haven't touched about them, maybe you can quickly uh, go item by item to answer those ones. Thank you. Okay, can I report? Can I let me start the hotline? Nairobi has a 
a particular number specifically for Nairobi, though we depend on 719, that's what, what the ministry said. But uh, the only thing I want to tell you that the people who receive those telephone numbers, sometimes they are, they are helpless. And I think there is a, a, a message I've sent to Kutranur, I hope you'll put it there, about the frustrations of electrical workers. Yes, you get an alert, you want to take action, but you cannot be able to take that action. That one also tells me about the second lab testing. Unfortunately for Nairobi, we don't have a specific lab testing for NMS. We depend on the private facilities, we depend on uh, Camry, we depend on, uh, we, we depend on, uh, we depend on um, KNH. Fortunately, a good Samantha has come in known as uh, IRRI, I, -R -R -I, I think this is a research organization. They have accepted to be testing our samples free of charge uh, on request. Otherwise, we don't have a specific facility we can tell somebody go to be tested in Nairobi. So unless we make a special arrangement so that we can take a specimen, then we can take to ear. But the response is not as good as uh, you, you, you may think. Now, the beds for case management. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Nairobi Metropolitan itself has only, let me say, 20 bed for case management at Imbagadi Hospital, which doesn't have uh, facilities for ICU. In fact, these beds are located the former, actually the I ward, if, if you know Imbagadi District Hospital, those are the only beds we have currently. Otherwise, what we have is just a plan. But for now, as we are talking currently, for now, we only have those 20 beds, which cannot be able to also cater for critical patients. The PPEs, the PPEs are available, and I can say they are even adequate. But the unfortunate thing, you and me know that sometimes for us healthcare workers, how do we adhere to the PPEs? So we have done some short assessment on how do we adhere to IPC practices, especially in our facilities. It's quite, it's not good. Uh, it's, it's not good, but uh, we are trying to tell our people that please, take care of yourselves for the little PPEs you have. Otherwise, we don't have any issues about PPEs when it comes to our care workers. The issue is basically about practice. I hope I've responded to your questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Ogaro. I think the importance of this forum is that we have people who listen in I'm at through. the highest level. I think level. I've responded to the questions. Yeah, you have responded to the questions and really for us, our role is really to escalate the challenges that you are facing. Through me, you can share so the quote I sent you about the frustration of the workers. Dr. Garo, can you hear us? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I guess uh, Dr. Maritim was just uh, making a comment that these are very important discussions to have. We have different people uh, along the chain of management listening into this session, and it's important that you highlight some of the frustrations that you have. I think I must say from your presentation, myself as a resident of Nairobi, I am scared because one, Nairobi has the highest number of cases and is going to continue to have a high number of cases. In the next two weeks, we may have double the number of cases that we have currently. And we have to think, we have to figure out what we will do very soon. Because for sure in the next few weeks, we'll see a doubling, a tripling, we'll have a thousand, maybe 2000 cases in Nairobi alone. And there has to be a strategy. It cannot be we are planning to, or we are planning to. There has to be a firm strategy and we have to see it being implemented and rolled out. I think for Nairobi, we need to take a pause and rethink this strategy because there's a problem. Yeah, sorry, I was struggling. May I, may I make a comment? This is Professor Nduati. Uh, Dr. Garo, thank you very much for this presentation. This is very honest. I think the, the, in this forum, um, the, 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 this, what this uh, presentation tells us is the county government health services are non-existent for the city of Nairobi as far as the context of this COVID pandemic is. The poor in our city who use the public services are damned. They don't have a service. The, the, the discussion that we will now look for a community isolation unit within the slums 
is a problem. It should have happened before we even said home-based care. We know every, anybody who's gone through the University of Nairobi Medical School has done child health in Kibera. You know that those houses, you cannot do home-based care within the slums of the city. So this, this really is a very serious problem. And those who will be attending their meeting this afternoon of the government must actually raise this, that the capital city of Nairobi that collects 40% of all taxes in Kenya does not have a service for their, for their citizens. I'm, I'm, I'm completely frightened, Lois. I agree with you. This is a horrendous situation. Thank you. Th thank you, Professor Nduati. You know, I, I, I'm being sincere, and as a professional, we have to be sincere that we basically have a problem in Nairobi, and it, it, it needs a solution as far as yesterday. Thank you, Dr. Ogaro. We've had your voice. We want to escalate this to the highest level. I think what we need is commitment from your end that we know that the county received its funding, the NMS rather, and we hope that in the next two weeks, Nairobi can actually up its facilities to 5,000 beds. You saw from the projection from uh, Dr. Lois's presentation, Nairobi will need up to 6,000 beds to manage symptomatic patients. These are patients who have moderate COVID, severe COVID and critically ill. So of that, a large proportion will actually be ICU beds. We had the presentation from uh, Dr. Sudi in Mombasa and uh, Dr. Mwangi in Nakuru that there will be spillover from the private sector. So a lot of uh, patients have gone to private sector, but it's because we don't have any system within uh, Nairobi. So I just hope that we have your support. We are here technically, you have the money. So we need to work together to improve the beds because if we don't take care of COVID in the community, in the informal settlements, then none of us is really safe. And really it's about test, treat, isolate, and as well as contact tracing. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Garo. Clearly this is a discussion that needs to go on beyond this forum. Uh, we appreciate you doing that presentation. Uh, allow me now to invite Dr. Mumbua from Kiambu County. Dr. Mumbua, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Please go ahead. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Lois, for your insightful presentation. Um, my name is Dr. Ambua. I'm a physician currently working in Tigoni at the Kiambu County COVID-19 Center in Dimuru, and I'm here to discuss our experience so far. So the outline of the talk today, we'll go through um, the Kiambu statistics on home-based care, as well as mortalities that we've been able to record. We'll also go through um, an update now from our facilities point of view. We'll go through a, se a severe case presentation, just one, and then go through some of the successes and um, challenges we've had uh, so far in our facility. So in terms of Kiambu County mortalities, um, we have, uh, I mean, just as we've uh, seen in other, in other uh, statistics, uh, age, is, um, age is actually um, a risk factor, and we've seen um, close to, uh, how many, what's the percentage? 32% of our patients are above 60%, so they're the ones who are um, majority of the people dying, followed by 41 to 50. Um, in terms of the patients who are in their second decade between 11 and 20, we had a 14-year-old boy who was hospitalized in Kenyatta. Uh, the patient had underlying um, comorbidity, he had, a leuke he had leukemia. Uh, with regards to gender, just like what we've seen in other, in other uh, mortality statistics, uh, majority of the patients who are dying are uh, males at 85% in Kiambu. Um, place of death, we have a uh, majority um, of these deaths occurring in various facilities, hospitals. We only have 12 uh, community deaths that have been recorded so far. In terms of our home-based care uptake, we can see that Ruiru um, is the one that has, really sub, Ruiru sub-county is the one that has taken home-based care um, compared to the other facilities, followed by Thika, Kiambu, and Kabete. We are rolling out the home-based care in Kiambu, and we are hoping to see um, higher numbers um, in, um, in home-based care. Um, now, update, now back to our facility. We had our first admission on the 27th of June, nearly four weeks ago. Cumulatively, we've been able to attend to 87 patients so far. A current number of patients who are admitted in our facility are 55. 
um, that was as of yesterday, but overnight we had eight new admissions. Um, so the new admissions as of uh, Wednesday uh, was 11. Uh, the stratification by gender is 35 males and 20 females. Our age range, range ranges from one year to 82, and we have four pediatric uh, patients. So the clinical status of the patients admitted, we have seven severe cases, three of them are males and four are female. We have two cases who have moderate disease and a good number of the, um, close to eight, more than 80% of our patients have um, mild disease but uh, we're not able to um, be housed uh, in, we're not able to self-isolate at home. In terms of the comorbidities of the admitted patients, we have seven who have hypertension, 11 have diabetes, we have four HIV positive patients. One has a cleptococcal meningitis, uh, fortunately with mild COVID. We do have a severe COVID patient who is on oxygen um, with TB also uh, in addition to age. We also have um, a 50 year old male with um, cirrhosis with septicemia um, doing better. Uh, we also have a, a new admission with a patient who is an elderly male with gastric carcinoma and anemia and we also have a patient who has um, heart failure. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we Hello? can hear you well, Dr. Ombwa. We can hear you. Okay. Okay, thank you. So um, fortunately, we've had 27 recoveries since in the last um, four weeks. We've been able to discharge four to home-based care. We do not have any patients on ventilators, and uh, we've had one referral. And uh, yesterday, we had our first mortality, and I'll go into the details of the mortality um, towards the end. We've had zero absconders. In terms of our age distribution, uh, my last presentation, we did not age patients in extreme ages, but now we do. We have a one-year-old, um, we've had a two-year-old as well, and now we have an eight, a two-year-old male as well, but he's doing, um, he's, he has severe COVID, but uh, faring on well with, no, uh, with low oxygen requirements, um, saturating well on five liters of oxygen. But that's our, gender, our, our age distribution. In terms of um, gender distribution, um, just as um, everything else, males are, are, predom are pre the predominance is um, the ratio of one to 1.7 with, male, uh, with a male pre um, predominance. Um, on to our case presentation, uh, we have a 42-year-old uh, MNW, he, uh, a female um, married businesswoman who resides in Kiambu, sub county in Kiambu. She was a referral from Kiambu level five where she was admitted there for eight days prior to re being referred to us once her COVID test uh, turned out positive. She was admitted to us on the 10th of July, 2020, and we've had her for 14 days today um, now. Her history, she presented with one week history of non-productive cough, uh, exertional dyspnea and pruritic chest pain associated with generalized body malaise and fever. Uh, prior to referral had been managed, now prior to referral in Kiambu, she had been managed for hyper, smaller hyper, um, hyperglycemic community acquired pneumonia, had been given free resuscitation and soluble insulin, and had also received five day uh, course of self on two grams PD and a three day course of azithromycin 500 OD. She had, she was unknown, she was known to have diabetes for longer than, for six years uh, then, previously on metformin and glyblenclamide. The control was unknown, we did not have a HbA1c uh, on admission, and she was also uh, hypertensive on 20 milligrams of nifedipine BD. Physical exam, we found a, a sick-looking middle-aged female um, who was in obvious respiratory distress. Her vitals were, she, she was really badly off at saturating at 90 on 15 liters of oxygen, and that was under, um, via an unrebreather mask. Her BT, BPs were okay, but she was, as you can see, she was quite tachypnic at 40 with a respirate of 15. Unfortunately, um, this was a patient who would require would have required ICU care, but we haven't yet established our ICU. We do have the equipment, but staffing um, as of now is not yet established. Investigations done, um, as I mentioned, she was SARS positive. Her full hemogram was um, not was remarkable for a thrombocytosis, a slight leukocytosis. A PBF showed a left shift with mature immature granulocytes. She had an elevated ESR of 105. Her urinalysis um, showed no ketones, uh, but she had glucosuria and a normal leukocyte count, no proteins and no nitrates. Her ECs and LFTs were normal. 
her in hospital progress. Uh, so she was admitted, sorry, with a diagnosis of severe COVID in a non-diabetic hypertensive patient with persistent hyperglycemia. Um, management plan, we started her because she was severe COVID with, um, with um, yeah, pneumonia, severe COVID pneumonia. We started her on six milligrams of dexamethasone once a day. We advise her to prone at least 16 hours a day and was maintained on high flow oxygen. At that point, she was saturating borderline at 89.90. We were to consider high flow nasal cannula if the saturations remain below 90% uh, on 15 liters um, per minute. We maintained her on soluble insulin 14 TDS and switched her to amlodipine and gave prophylactic anticoagulation alongside omeprazole uh, because of the steroids. We discontinued the antibiotic therapy. Um, um, on the 11th, she remained quite dysnic with high oxygen requirements, but just saturating at 90% on 15 liters. SpO2s of oxygen were still low at 65. She had persistent hyperglycemia of um, RBSs above uh, 15, uh, 15 to 17. We, we now introduced, because she was out of her acute um, hyperglycemic state, we introduced uh, mixed start insulin at 28, 14. Her blood pressure was also uh, noted to be high, uh, so we added losartan uh, 50 milligrams once a day. Uh, between the 10th and the 13th, improvement was noted of her oxygen requirements. She was now saturating at 92 to 94 and 15 liters of oxygen. She was now um, proning as, as uh, encouraged, and so we continued, to, we continued to advise her to prone. On the 14th, her SpO2s of oxygen was now 71, improved from the previous uh, 65 that was noted on the 11th, and she was saturating at 97 on 15 liters. So we were able to taper down to 12 liters, um, and she was saturating more. On the 15th to 20th, we, improvement was noted with saturations. Her hyperglycemia persisted, so we increased the mix that progressively over this period to 32 16. We introduced metformin. And even on the 20th of um, July, we added vildagliprin 15 milligrams of D. Her blood pressure remained high, um, um, despite now the amlodipine and losartan, so we added methylopa. Why methylopa? These are the antihypertensives anti we have. On the 23rd, she was uh, saturating at 86 of oxygen, requiring uh, 4 liters uh, to saturate above 94, so her oxygen requirements were uh, reducing um, progressively well. On the 23rd of July, as now yesterday, she was the Disney has significantly reduced. She was tolerating periods of oxygen um, and she was saturating between 6 and 88 on room air. Um, she is currently on 2 liters of oxygen, saturating at 93. Her blood pressure was now well controlled on methyl dopa 500 BD, loss at 15, and lodipine 10. Her hyperglycemia had also improved um, on the three um, drugs, insulin and the two anti-diabetics. Anti so far, in terms of our wins, we've had 27 recoveries. Out of these three patients, have had severe COVID. Um, I, my first, my last presentation, I presented KM, a 38-year-old male with no comorbidities, who had severe hypoxia, um, as low as 60 of oxygen. We managed him um, for hospital-acquired pneumonia. This was because he was previously a febrile, and he was not responding to um, our treatment. He was getting leukocytosis and fever. So we managed him with seven days of ceftazidim uh, in addition, and we were able to discharge him two days ago. Um, we, are, we discharged him alongside his wife and a two-year-old who were actually admitted to our facility as well. So we discharged the family home. We also had a 22-year-old male um, with no comorbidities and who had severe um, uh, pneumonia, COVID pneumonia, but was able, but responded well of, um, to dexamethasin and pruning. We did not introduce any antibiotics, and um, after 14 days, he was discharged. Um, that's after three days, um, the, his last three days where he remained symptom-free. So we also discharged a 46-year-old male uh, who had mm -hmm. both diabetes, no, diabetes and hypertension. Yes. We discharged him on uh, high doses of mixtard, metformin, and vildagliptin. In terms of our loss, uh, our mortality, we, uh, as I'd mentioned, we had our first mortality yesterday. He was JN, a 65-year-old male, who was, a, who was a referral from a private facility in Nairobi County and required ICU admission. So this, um, as, I, as mentioned before, we are having an influx of admissions um, that are coming from private facilities. This gentleman had been admitted in two private facilities and now moved to a public facility because of financial constraints. Despite telling us, despite telling them we did not have an ICU bed, the patient landed um, at, on our, in, at, um, in our facility. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Mumboa, for that presentation. I think you're doing an incredible job uh, for a fairly large number of patients. 
uh, Kiambu has grown up very fast in COVID management and well, really, really well done. Good job to you. Thank that you. issue of ICU is sad. Um, I think in a previous presentation, we were told Kiambu County Hospital had a nice had a capacity for ICU. Is that the case? Mm -hmm. So um, we do have the equipment. The issue is that um, in terms of critical care, mm. particularly in Tigoni, we are yet to have um, critical care staffing. So that what is will what it take for you to get that? Um, I know we are working on it currently. We are trying to see whether we can have, like in our facility, we are yet to have an anesthesiologist. So we are trying to work on that, either sub an, an, in, an in, inter-county, um, intra-county, sorry, transfer from one hospital mm -hmm. to another. We also, mm -hmm. we, are, we also have 20 critical care nurses. We're trying to split them be between the four isolation units. Mm -hmm. So uh, progress is being made in terms of staffing, but yeah, we are yet to completely um, start basically, completely get ready. Okay. Last mm -hmm. week you showed us the nice pictures of your high flow nasal cannula. Are you using them? <laughs> Yes, uh, we for this gentleman who died, we would have uh, that's what we were, we intended to use, but then he unfortunately succumbed. Okay, if you're not using, we can swing them <laughs> our way. We still don't have any, but thank thank you, Doc. Thank you for that presentation and um, keep sharing the lessons you're learning along the way. I think you're doing really well with the patients you have. Thank you. Okay, now please allow me to invite Dr. Mutusi from Machakos. This is the first Mutusi. time. Hmm? Mdusi. Okay, Dr. Thranira corrected me. Sorry, Dr. Mdusi. This is the first time you're having Machakos join us, so, or second time. Okay. Dr. Mdusi Karibu Sana, can you hear me? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay. Let me just upload my slides. Sorry, that's the wrong one. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Dr. Ntusi. I am a family physician and the Director of Medical Services, Machakos County. This is the second time we are making a presentation. The first time was in mid-May. Uh, we had not uh, received uh, a patient. I think soon after that is when we started seeing patients. So I'll give our experience between May and July, uh, continuing from where we left at that time. This is how our curve looks like from the point we received the first patient. Um, and like everyone else, we've in the last few days noted that steady uh, increase and uh, I think a day ago is when we got the highest number of positive cases in a day that was uh, close to uh, 60 patients um, at a go and um, currently we have um, majority of the patients admitted in various hospitals I'll show how we've distributed our isolation beds but we've also recorded um, a, sick, a good number of uh, recoveries uh, from those patients um, and also some deaths I'll summarize. Males, like everyone else, keep, I mean, most of our patients are male for the reasons that have been uh, brainstormed about. We are still finding out if there are any others. And the age group is between 30 to 34, 35 to 39, that's the most affected. We have nine sub-counties in Machakos County and Mavoko sub-county, which is near Nairobi at the river, the border with Nairobi. This is where we have majority of our cases. Um, and so like uh, somebody presented from Nairobi, there's an overlap between Machakos and Nairobi because of the movement in and out. But we have patients in all our sub-counties except one. Um, yeah, so. That's a bit of a crowded uh, table, but just to highlight for now, we've seen 584 uh, positive uh, cases and um, cumulative deaths have been 23. So this 
15 of these have actually been from outside, but there are people who have um, links in Mashakos, so they have to be interned here. So ours have been um, about half of that. Um, so yeah, those are the cases and those who have recovered. Um, 53 on home isolation and the 23 uh, deaths. So when you look at our institutional versus home-based care, currently it's a 50-50. We have of all our post currently active cases, half of them are home on, on home-based care and half are in our institutions. And for our institutional care, we have only one main, main facility, and uh, not only one, but there are several, but um, the only is coming in because we made use of the only stadium that we have. And I think Nairobi can uh, borrow a leaf because we have very many stadiums. It takes less than a week to set up this structure and um, put in the, the rest of the equipment and facilities that we need and patients can be comfortably managed. Um, we have other facilities I uh, will show, but for the community-based care or home-based care, um, then this is what we found can also be a very good uh, way, especially in, in, in places where the patients are asymptomatic and are um, or mild symptoms. So initially, of course, we have to call when we get the results, break the news. There's an initial team that goes and visits them, composed of a, a senior clinician or physician. These are patients maybe who have never been to a healthcare uh, professional or to assess their, their clinical status. They may report verbally that they do not have any chronic illnesses, but we always do a usual assessment, take a blood pressure, take a blood sugar, and draw samples for uh, for blood workups. And then the follow-up visit will be, of course, during that initial visit, we also assess the home for suitability using the checklist provided by the guidelines. Follow-up visits will be done by the surveillance officers to check on the patient and check that they are not developing any symptoms and they can also call back in case they have anything they want to report. And finally, we we, we, we have been testing them, at least um, one, one final negative test, um, and then we reintegrate them into society. Mm -hmm. Integration is important because when people see uh, teams coming in every day, there is some stigmatization still there, so we need to put them back into the community. And uh, we are in a semi-urban, very urban but rural, majority rural area, so we demonstrate some of these um, IPC measures in the home environment. It really works when you have the entire family uh, involved, hand hygiene, and uh, being able to properly use uh, masks. One of our challenges, uh, part of our challenges have been, of course, HR related um, in, in terms of staffing our, our units. There are logistical uh, challenges, especially for the home-based uh, care, we need to move our teams. We need to move, uh, you know, services deep into the community. Sometimes with the uh, infrastructure issues. And the last one is what um, Sud reported about stressing and treating. People are now coming to us, you know, in public vehicles and, and flashing their, their 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 results, you know, from elsewhere, from a private lab or something. So they get Don't into a. Please wrap up. Yeah. So this is important because the, the surge in patients is now coming in without um, any communication. And this is important for the counties that are around um, ourselves and others, because th this really complicates our tracing. We, ha we have now to find out who else was exposed by these positive patients who just travel uh, by public means. Um, we are debriefing and desensitizing our staff just to ensure that they don't keep um, getting reinfected and our coordinated efforts um, we believe will bear a fruit in the teamwork. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much Dr. Nfusi. Your level of preparedness is impressive. I just wanted to get from you, for the entire Machakos County, how many COVID isolation beds do you have? Uh, so for, for our isolation beds, um, I had a table Mm -hmm. But we have slightly above 450 uh, mm -hmm. scattered in uh, the sub-counties, mm -hmm. different sub-counties. 
Mm -hmm. um, so the main one is the stadium has a capacity of 240, mm -hmm. but then we also have the level five hospital, uh, a level four hospital and a level three facility, uh, all totaling to about uh, 473. And how many patients do you have currently? Like what's the percentage occupancy? Yeah, just around 40%. Our oh. ICU, which is a mm -hmm. uh, COVID ICU is just over half. We have 11 beds and currently we have uh, five patients in there. Two have been in um, a critical condition with the vent. One that the sickest is a, a young girl who has a chronic renal uh, failure on, on dialysis. Uh, so currently stable, we had we extubated her and she's now uh, stable. Okay, and maybe just to help, um, this the tent that you have, the one with the 240 bed, uh, what is available in other than the beds, like if you needed oxygen, uh, water, what's available in the tent? So we have um, oxygen concentrators mm -hmm. with a portable. So each, each bed we've, we've, we've had, we've organized sockets and power points at uh, each, each point uh, for, for heating and for, for connecting the oxygen concentrators and all the other supplies are there, but generally for patients with moderate um, conditions. So we have a team that was posted and dedicated for care of such those patients, daily rounds, medical officers, uh, nursing, the entire um, team that are requiring the daily care. But now when they complicate or need ICU care, the stadium is only 200 meters from the level five hospital and where the ICU is and we have dedicated ambulances to ferry the patients as needed. Wow, that's excellent. I think a lot of counties can learn from your level of preparedness. I hope you're also engaging with the private sector so that they are prepared and they are managing patients adequately and can transfer as needed. Yes, that's happening. In fact, we have the MOH team this week that's been going around with us to just visit the facilities, including the private hospitals to uh, just assess the level of preparedness and um, we, we keep in touch every day because we cross-refer patients. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Nkusi. That's excellent. Um, allow me now to invite Dr. Maria from Meru County. Dr. Maria, you're there? Uh, yes. Please go ahead. Um, okay, let me just share my slides. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Maria Mwangi. I'm a medical officer at Meru Teaching and Referral Hospital. I'm presenting the case uh, updates for Meru County. Unfortunately, the person who was meant to do the presentation today couldn't make it, so I'm standing in. So currently, uh, so far we have had 35 cases reported in Meru, 18 have recovered, and all of those, uh, they, were they were asymptomatic. Uh, six patients are still being actively managed. Three uh, have moderate to severe symptoms and are at the isolation facility at Meru Teaching and Referral, and the uh, other Three are at the Mboroga Isolation Unit. Four have currently are on home-based care, and one is in prison isolation at the Remand Center. Uh, we had one health worker who had confirmed positive eh, and was a contact of one of the positive cases, uh, now tested negative as, for, as per yesterday, and has been released from home-based care. Uh, currently, the county is still uh, trying to mitigate uh, further cases and we are continuing to investigate suspect cases. We have an emergency hotline that, uh, that is well known to the public and uh, we are finding that many people are using it. Uh, we are following up our, our cases, our positive cases from isolation and the quarantine area to their homes through the public health office and the disease surveillance. We are continuing screening at our county entry points. Uh, this is a symptomatic screening and also thermal, just thermal screening at some point. 
Um, we're also advising those who are traveling from high risk areas uh, to self quarantine and isolate at their homes. And we're finding that the community has been very beneficial in this effort in enforcing that. Uh, of the three cases that we have uh, in our isolation unit at Merit Teaching and Referral, two are of note. Um, the first is patient SK. He was a 37 year old male who <laughs> was diagnosed with, um, who is a non hypertensive CKD patient with anemia and was diagnosed with SARS CoV 2. Uh, on the 15th of last month, uh, he was oh, on the 14th of last month, uh, and this was secondary to a retractable dis difficulty in breathing, a fever, and a cough, despite uh, adequate antimicrobial treatment, as determined by blood culture. He's a patient who had been on had ongoing dialysis over the last month and he had a septic catheter insertions, insertion site, but uh, we tried to manage it, but the patient still was not getting better. So upon clinical suspicion, that's when the SARS-CoV-2 uh, test was done and he turned positive. Currently, uh, the patient is stable. He is saturating at 94% on room air. He does have uh, intermittent hemoptysis, uh, but it is resolving uh, above and beyond his antihypertensives, which is hydralazine, 50 milligrams TDS, methyl dopa, 50 BD, and uh, furosemide, 40 BD. We are giving the patient also vitamin, vitamin C, um, just as an adjunct treatment. The next patient, uh, which was a uh, an interesting case as well, he is patient SK, a 67-year-old male. He is a newly diagnosed hypertensive CCF uh, stage 3 CKD patient who was admitted with a two-week history of cough and abdominal discomfort on the 6th. And thereafter, upon a clinical suspicion, uh, secondary to um, his chest x-ray and also his history of travel from Padiado County, a SARS-CoV-2 uh, test was done. Uh, this patient, uh, had, we later found out that it was uh, SARS-CoV-2 induced hyperglycemia. We had done a HbA1c, which gave us a 12.6, but uh, as we continued with the uh, insulin therapy using the sliding scale, we found by the 10th day, of admission, there was no need for, there was no insulin requirement. So we found that um, quite interesting. Then uh, he improved thereafter. Uh, and as of yesterday, he was released from the isolation unit, though still testing positive, but having, having completed 21 uh, days of isolation. I would, if people could chime in on that, uh, the release of home base, of positive cases for home based care, uh, maybe we could learn from other centers. So, uh, the advances we've made so far is we have an oxygen plant uh, that is now functional, attached to the ICU renal. Hello, Doc. Hello. Okay. Um, sorry, we lost you for a minute there. Are you done? Uh, almost, almost. It's okay. brief. So, um, we also have the ICU unit, uh, which is being commissioned tomorrow, though not dedicated to SARS-CoV-2 patients. We also have uh, six ventilators in the isolation unit, uh, which are functional. Those are just pictures of our new oxygen plant. Um, our challenges so far is uh, the turnaround time for results to come back from the national testing facilities. Uh, we're also having uh, problems with patients who need critical care, since as much as we have six ventilators, we don't have an intensivist, and our ICU is not yet functional. 
and of course the occasional PP shortages. That's all. Thank you. I'll take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Maria. I, I like your oxygen plant. I wish you could share some oxygen with us. Uh, but thank you for that presentation. And I think one of the things uh, from the patients you presented is, um, no, Meru County, again, has a high proportion of elderly patients and also yes. high prevalence of various comorbidities. So preparing to have, it's good that you have adequate oxygen, but also now that preparation to manage more critically ill patients is going to be very critical. Uh, sorry important <laughs> without using the word critical again uh, because you're likely to see a high proportion of patients presenting with severe disease. So thank you so much for your presentation. Um, allow me now to invite Dr. Zaituni from Transzoya County. Dr. Zaituni, you're there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Okay, please go ahead. So yeah, this presentation was prepared by myself. I'm a pharmacoepidemiologist from Transoya County and Dr. Yvette Kisaka and Brian Ateka, part of the response team. Um, just an overview of Transoya County, we have uh, three isolation facilities, one in Mount Elgon, uh, which has a 32 bed capacity, um, the Kaisagat facility, which has seven bed capacity, and the new flagship project, which has a 300 bed capacity, but so far we have 100 beds in the new facility. So a total of 139 beds. And then we have one ICU with five beds. Uh, uh, Dr. Zaituni, we've lost you for a minute there. Dr. Zaituni? Dr. Zaituni, can you hear us? Okay, uh, Dr. Zaituni, I don't know if you can hear us. If you're having trouble, you could end your presentation. We have someone else present, then we'll have you back once you've sorted out the issue. So, uh, Frida from Kilifi County. Uh, Frida, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Lois. Hi, please go ahead. Hi, uh, sorry, I've been lost in the forum. Let me just share my screen. Okay, thank you. You can see my slides? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Okay, so my name is Josri Dango. I'm an emergency and critical care clinician. I'll be presenting for Kilifi County. Uh, so we have two, two functional isolation centers currently in Kilifi. We have Kilifi COVID Complex and Sajana Mutwapa, one functional quarantine center that is going to see Kilifi. Then we have a 384 bed iso uh, capacity of isolations. We have ICU beds too, but I would just uh, be clear to say we have two functional beds. That's a bed and ventilator and, and monitors. Uh, currently, our oxygen plant is non-functional. We are on manifold system and currently dependent on BOC for supply. So as it shows in our targeted testing, because we are not able to do mass testing because of the uh, lack of uh, sufficient kids, the males still outweigh the female in terms of percentages. We have a 31% of female, over 69% of male in our county currently. Total tested, we have 3,394, cumulative case of 95, having two health workers uh, infected, one who is cleared and one now in isolation. A total of 29 females, male 66, discharged from us are 47. We have extra counted. These are 
people who came to Kilifi, but uh, they are not actually our residents, but was tested here. We had some from Kuala and Mombasa. And in, currently in isolation, we have 17 cases. 10 of those cases are in our isolation centers. Seven are in, on home-based care. We have one mortality. This is a patient who was actually diagnosed uh, in, in Mombasa. No, it, he was diagnosed in Nairobi, but was a patient from Toronto. But uh, when we got the report, the patient had already succumbed. But he had comorbidities, comorbidities and was a male. So as of yesterday, we had three new cases. One case is currently in Mombasa, had been tested uh, in Kilifi, but was referred uh, for Mombasa for private, uh, for private facility. Then the two new cases are yet to be brought on board. Uh, comorbidities, we just had hypertension, diabetes, asthma, one case, and TB. So contact stress, as of yesterday, we had 465 self-quarantine at camp. There are 50 cases, finished 14 days quarantine of 115. Currently at the KMTC, we have zero isolations. Uh, we, we have a transport system designated ambulances available for contact tracing and evacuation, and hotlines are available to the community. Our communities are well sensitized, so they'll always give us an alert in case of any cases or any suspected cases in the community. So we have seven sub-counties, that is Kilifi North, Kilifi South, Ganze, Magarini, Kalolini, Mariakani, and Rabai. And all sub-counties have rapid response teams, and they are all responsible for contact tracing. Uh, about a week ago, we had the training of uh, critical care for COVID patients, which is currently ongoing. We've had 15 of, the, of our staff being trained. Uh, in terms of community awareness, the counties, that's the public health uh, teams are working hand in hand with the CHVs and Yumbakumi elders in terms of sensitization, because we've realized there's been a lot of black city, especially in terms of social distancing, in terms of putting on masks, because most of our cases are mainly uh, asymptomatic and we have not had major fatalities, so our communities have been really on the lax. But this laxity, I would also place it back to also health workers, because also it's unfortunate, but some of us don't even believe that there is uh, corona out here. So also in terms of aid, we've got some partners who have come in to support us in, um, in terms of PPE. We received uh, PPEs from Equity Foundation, and um, the elderly are still receiving stipends and incentives from the national government to cushion them economically. Um, so our main testing currently, Cambridge does the testing as the main lab, but we also want to acknowledge that it's doing a regional. Within the region, it's the main lab. Though we have Mombasa doing its own, but when they are going, they also drop it down to Cambry. We have Malindi that has not really been uh, at much capacity, but it's still helping out. Our turnaround time is 24 hours to 48, depending on numbers of samples. Though we are having also backlogs in this uh, report, so sometimes we have delay in, uh, in the reporting. So total number of health workers trained, 214. Currently, in terms of critical care, we still remain at four. That is ICU staff, one critical care clinician, who is me, and four ICU nurses. We don't have an anesthesiologist, but we are hoping we should be able to use contract one. Uh, all healthcare workers have been sensitized on APC at their facilities by respective teams. PPEs are now available. Protocols and SOPs are available in both isolation, quarantine, and all health facilities. Uh, so challenges, there are burnouts, not having to, uh, and burnouts I'll talk in terms of the, especially the staff who are working in the isolation facilities who have to work, as I initially said, our working schedules are 24, you work 24 hours in two weeks. So in a day, in, in a shift, you're working two weeks, you work 24 hours and we reside within the facilities given out. So people are getting burnouts 
and also I think in the whole department because of now the, we, the, our staffing is low and uh, people are getting overwhelmed because I don't think we've employed extra people to come in to help but we are hopeful that the county will see us through on those ones. Still our lances are lagging on this side on in terms of support to healthcare workers. Stigma is still at high levels. Uh, initially I talked about laxity. In terms of human resource, especially in the critical care team, I'd like to reiterate what uh, Dr. Mange had said. In our facilities, ma mainly we have the building and the beds, and we think that's enough, but we still need to work on that. And our critical care team is very small. We cannot really manage. Though, as you remember, earlier I presented on Bonfas, who was one of our critical care patients. We are happy that we discharged him home last week on Sunday. We still manage him uh, from severe disease to now being uh, uh, cured of COVID and home currently. Uh, but the other thing we also noticed with our patient, maybe something I can talk of, which is not on my slide, it's that uh, uh, this patient uh, had uh, hypoglycemia that, he, that ended up being managed with uh, insulin because initially this uh, patient was a truck driver, 34 year old, no known comorbids, but presented to a facility with COVID in distress and uh, with a true picture of a real COVID patient and nothing else under <clears throat> Please Okay, after two days of admission, that's when we realized he had, he had sugars which were really skyrocketing. So we are yet to see how the viral maybe is either in the pancreas is affected by this virus that would trigger some of these patients to have uh, diabetes. So as I wrap up, I say self-love is paramount, especially during this time of COVID, and to encourage all of us to maintain the standards kept, put on a mask, social distance, sanitize, and wash our hands as frequently as possible. Safety first to all our healthcare workers before you attend to this patient. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for that presentation. I mean, we feel that appeal of burnout and I hope you're able to work with the county teams to think around uh, how you can have sufficient healthcare personnel. Uh, your closing statement about taking care of ourselves first is extremely important. Thank you. Now, allow me to bring back Dr. Zaituni. Uh, uh, Frida, if you could uh, remove your presentation. Okay. Zaituni, you're there? Yes. Sorry, okay. Transila County has internet problems. Thank, thank God we don't need internet for COVID management. Yeah. <laughs> so just a, a couple of minutes to finish your presentation, please. Yes. So yeah, we have four active cases, two in Mount Elgon isolation facility, one under home-based care, and one in Cherangani nursing home, which is a private facility. Um, okay, so the index case was a 15-year-old female who was asymptomatic, who had traveled from Mombasa through a truck. Uh, the surveillance team was alerted and then they took the patient to isolation after they tested positive for COVID. Um, they, they managed her with vitamin C and psycho psychological support before discharge. The second case was a 30-year-old male who was also asymptomatic. He went for a self-test in Lancet, uh, which turned out positive. So they were admitted in the Mount Elgon facility due to stigma in the, in the community. And they were discharged after two weeks after the two tests turned out negative. The third and fourth case um, are both drivers. One is a bus driver through Kitale Kisumu route. The other one is a truck driver, Kitale Nairobi. They were both asymptomatic. Um, they went for the mass testing so that they get a certificate for uh, to be able to, trans to, to work in transport. But they were both non-hypertensive patients. Uh, who are not on treatment. One was managing it through diet and the other one had defaulted on treatment a year ago. But on admission, their BPs were higher than 200 over 100, uh, which was a bit shocking to the staff that were managing them. 
since they were really asymptomatic, but they were put on treatment. All the other tests were unremarkable. The fifth case is a healthcare worker, a nurse in the renal, uh, renal unit in, in one of the facilities. She's a 29 year old. Uh, she presented with a sore throat and flu-like symptoms. She had initially self-medicated on augmentin and paracetamol. Um, um, she also presented with diminished taste and smell. After the, colleague pushed, the colleagues pushed her to go and get tested for COVID, which turned out to be positive, so she's in self-isolation at home. She's being managed with vitamin C and E and also psychological support. Uh, there were no recorded deaths in Transoya County. However, we have had four burials in Transoya County, two in Kiminini sub-county and two in Cherangani sub-county. That is the burial team preparing to bury one of the dead, dead people. The county also has hotline numbers, uh, which the general public uses to either alert the surveillance team or report possible cases. And we also use the 719 Safaricom line. Um, in terms of challenges, uh, we have a staff shortage. Uh, so this is going to bring some kind of burnout in the near future. We also have a lab, uh, a reference lab that can do uh, the test, the turnaround is one day. However, we do lack uh, sufficient test kits uh, to run consistently. And then we also lack as a maintenance, um, sorry, as in we, we can't uh, frequently service our machines. So maybe the county needs to help us in that area. We also had um, insufficient PPEs, but yesterday we received some from the COVID fund. Um, we also need to, to equip our ICU. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Zaituni, for that presentation. I think the need for equipping the ICU cannot be overstated. Um, and remember, equipping ICU just doesn't serve COVID. It will serve even beyond COVID. So I hope we can keep working with the county to make sure that's done. Just one comment I wanted to make. I noticed, um, I think this was a previous presenter, mm -hmm. and I had had it with another presentation as well, about putting patients on all these different vitamin supplements. I think it's good to note that as at now we don't have evidence for use of any of this so we need to be careful about what drugs are being given out there they may not be harmful but we don't really have anything to make us use them for now thanks dr zaituni we're glad you have ppe keep up the good work um i'd have to ask for your indulgence because we have uh two brief presentations one from tukana and one from uh KNH kindly allow us a few additional minutes so that we can look at this and uh, answer just a few questions. Thank you very much. Dr. Kemwa, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dr. Kemwa. So far, Tukana, we have 28 cases, zero deaths, and we have 12 recoveries. So we have tested 1,367, 1, uh, 28 cases are positive. So of all the 100 community testing that we are doing as part of the NOREB initiative of community testing, none has turned positive. Then um, notably is our index case, the first case that we had in Trukana. All the subsequent repeat tests have been turning out to be positive, but the client is in home isolation. Then, as you all remember, the famous Nadapal drivers, we brought them to our COVID center in Lodwa for better management. They have been also been having persistent posi positive results. Uh, so of note, at our COVID center, we have 11 patients, uh, 10 asymptomatic. We had one who had mild symptoms uh, from day three to day five, but currently the client is asymptomatic. Then we have a discrepancy. The national figure is 22 for Trukana but for the count is 28. This is because we had a disparity. There were some tests that came from Lancet that were not added to the tally for the national, but we captured them in our tally. I don't know why 
uh, the national team has not yet captured. So for our symptomatic clients who had mild symptoms, on day three of treatment, he developed a cough and a sore throat, but SpO2 was normal. The patient was just stable, so he was given some antibiotics, some oral antibiotics, throat lozenges, and paracetamol. And within two days, the patient uh, became asymptomatic. Uh, uh, that's just showing the distribution of the cases in Trukana West and uh, with the epicenter being Kakuma. Uh, I think I've already alluded this. Uh, our positivity rate is 2.5%. So we launched the ICU. The governor launched it two days ago. But what I can say about this ICU, it's not yet ready in terms of human resource and also in terms of uh, equipment. The ICU currently can only handle one patient comfortably. Though it's a three-bed ICU, uh, it can only handle one patient, one patient comfortably. We still don't have an anesthesiologist or an intensivist. We just have two critical care nurses. Uh, we, the, the 64 slice CT scan, uh, this was through the MES scheme. They replaced the 16 slice uh, CT scan. So I think the governor, when he was launching the ICU, passed by through there. So we procured three ambulances. These are going to be purely for COVID response uh, because initially our ambulances were, uh, were, were being used both for other referrals uh, to Eldoret. So these ones are going to be just for COVID. Then after COVID, they're going to be put in the usual pool. Then we received some PPEs from Equity uh, the other day, or I think on Monday last week. Um, so we, Cambria has promised to give us a PCR machine. I think uh, they're working on the site of installation. And um, UNHCR has procured a gene expert machine for Kakuma. And uh, I, I think in the next two weeks, already they've already procured the COVID cartridges for the gene expert. So we are going to reduce the turnaround time and also the distance of transferring the uh, the samples to Eldoret, which is around 500 kilometers from Trukana. So I think in the next one month, we'll be able to uh, ramp up our testing capacity. That's all for Trukana. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Arif. Well done for finally launching your ICU. And I hope, you know, um, we are just sitting here and wondering what it costs to hire anesthetists because there seems to be such a shortage of anesthetists in all the counties uh, yet they're going to be very critical in helping us manage our critical care units especially because we don't have many critical care specialists so we really hope you're able to get an anesthetist and i hope your staff went to mtrh for the training and are back and uh, maybe just to ask what happened to the truck drivers did you discharge them they have not been discharged. We are, they, they actually were transferred from the border, brought to Lodwa at our COVID isolation center. So the but national you've had them government for 50 days. Actually heading to 60. Then the, the, the MOH team at National wrote a letter for them to be discharged. But I think our CC uh, was still adamant. They have to be kept until uh, the, the tests are negative. So they have been, there has been that tussle about the track level. Oh. 60 days anyway yes. okay it's not your battle we will <laughs> talk to the moh team about i think that uh, must be a source of significant frustration for the patients yes uh, but thank you we really hope you get some stuff because one i see your bed uh, you'll you'll be stuck in making decisions about who to give the bed and who to leave out so we really hope uh, that issue of health uh, healthcare personnel is sorted out. Thank you very much, Doc. Okay. And Dr. Mbuvi, you can finish the session from for us. Dr. Mbuvi? Yes, uh, yes I'm here. Okay. Hi, mm -hmm. hello. Uh, let me just share my screen. It will be a quick presentation. Uh, sorry, we missed out last week. Uh, we had a, mm -hmm. a busy a busy day. Uh, so I'll just give the statistics uh, based on what we currently have at uh, KNH. At our Mbagati isolation facility, currently we have 46 patients who are admitted there. Some of them are on O2. Others are symptomatic patients who have been taken care of. In the ICU, uh, we have seven patients. In our daycare center, which is for healthcare workers, we have seven patients. Ward 42 currently has about eight patients. Uh, it, it now holds confirmed cases as well because the numbers have actually gone up. Uh, Clinic 66, that is mostly for our OBS gain 
uh, patients has uh, four confirmed cases currently and also has some beds for suspected cases. So as uh, up to, since the time we began, we have had a total cumulative admissions of 588 uh, patients who have come into the facility who have been confirmed positive. We have managed to discharge 403 of them. Our mortality as of yesterday stands at 96 and uh, the patients who we have taken care of in our ICU stands at 31. Uh, so maybe a bit of the mortality is, is that we have 96 patients as of, as of yesterday, the 23rd of uh, June, July, sorry. Uh, of these, 70 of them uh, are male and 26 are female. As you can see, it's a higher prevalence in males. More males are, are dying as compared to females. Uh, the ones who are less than 15 years old have been four of them, including our one year old. Uh, more, the ones who are above the age of 55 years and mostly with comorbids, 44 of them. And between the ages of 16 and 54, we've had 48 uh, mortalities, all of them with varying um, uh, comorbidities uh, whom we, we have actually seen. Uh, so in terms of critical care, I've, I've, had, I've listened to the critical care presentations, um, especially from Nakuru County and the things they're saying about what you basically need to run an ICU. And I have to say that this is true. Currently, we have uh, uh, six beds uh, with a capacity increase to seven, uh, but we're currently at capacity. And uh, mortalities are, uh, we're still getting mortalities, especially from late referrals uh, from other facilities. And, uh, more, and that actually we've had like two from private facilities who have come. And unfortunately, those patients have come because they came in a bit late. So I've also had all the, uh, the other presenters who have talked about uh, spillover cases from private facilities. So this is also happening to us in KNH. So it's becoming a bit of a challenge uh, on, on managing these patients. And, uh, but so far, uh, in terms of the challenges that we're getting, is just that basically there's an increased demand of ICU, and then now ensuring that uh, the healthcare workers we work with are, are taking the necessary precautions and are having PPEs provided for them. Uh, the thing is, we, we have, uh, at the at the hospital, since we are now at a point where we are increasing our capacity to manage COVID-19 patients, we are not only using our Mbagathi facility and the ICU and the Clinic 66 and Ward 42, like I mentioned earlier, but we are now also opening up other wards within the hospital tower block, uh, especially for medical patients in the seventh floor, for surgical patients in the fifth floor, and for pediatric cases in the third floor, and also for the private wing patients uh, in the 10th floor of the hospital. So as you can see, our capacity to uh, manage COVID cases is actually increasing, and we need to keep increasing the spaces where we are actually taking in patients. Um, the cases that we, we have seen mostly is a number of patients are, are presenting with DKA or hyperglycemia, uh, most of them, the ones who are presenting BKA, some of them have actually had a history of diabetes. Some have had a history of not, not good compliance with medication. Others have been very compliant with medication, and yet they come in with BKA. So it's uh, some of the things we are, we are looking into. We do have one child in the ACU currently who presented with a cerebrovascular accident. And this child is actually 11 years old, uh, presented with a mid-cerebral artery infarct. And it's one of the cases that we're actually investigating to try and see whether is this COVID related? Because I know there are some cases where COVID patients have presented with stroke. It's 11 years. And maybe once you get those, it's one of the cases that you can be able to present in our next, in our next meeting. Uh, in terms of increasing our preparedness, like I've said, we're increasing the capacity with new wards, which have been designated for COVID-19 isolation in the medical, surgical, and pediatrics and private wing. Uh, we're also uh, planning to increase our ICU capacity to 15 bed ICU. There's a unit within the hospital which was basically used for treatment of multi-drug resistant TB. It's a proper isolation unit with uh, UV light treated ventilation systems. It has negative pressure rooms. And this is where we want to move to so that we can be able to have a very well controlled environment for us to be able to manage our critically ill patients. So these are some of the things that we're currently working on and hoping that before the end, uh, before the end of this month, that some of these, uh, this actually this ICU can be operational and we can be able to move our patients to on that side. Uh, the good news is that now our machine, which is working, um, the KNH machine for testing, is now giving us a, a good turnaround time of 24 hours. So it's also helping us in terms of our management of patients. We're able now to get results much faster, helping us make decisions much quicker and knowing where exactly we're going to, uh, how we're going to manage these patients, whether within uh, the KNH hospital grounds themselves, or do we move them to Magathi? That has been one of the things. And also getting donations of PPEs, especially from, we recently got some from the equity fund and the COVID-19 fund. So at least we're, we're getting PPEs. But as you have seen that um, as the hospital, as the number of patients keeps increasing, uh, it feels like there's a time that will reach where 
most likely the entire KNH block might actually be just full of COVID patients because at the rate that we are going, we have had to now, we're slowly increasing our capacity, finding that we have to get additional spaces on where to manage our patients who are coming into COVID-19. Uh, so that has been what uh, has been um, going on at KNH. Uh, hopefully next on Friday we can give a better presentation, mostly focusing on we can look at the mortalities and maybe the interesting case of this child who came in with a cerebral vascular accident. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, yes, we can end there. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mbuvi. I think next week we should do an exposition of all the mortalities. We notice the mortality is quite high. I yeah. know we've had uh, transfer ins of patients who had died already in the process of transfer or died as soon as they got here. So maybe the encouragement is also for people if they need to refer patients to do so early and also for patients to present early. But hopefully we can go through and really think of what is it, where are patients dying and what are some of the things that you can do to turn this around. Uh, thank you very much for the hard work that you continue to do at KNH. Uh, so thank you everyone. There are a few questions. Maybe you can allow us another five minutes just to answer some of them. Uh, so one, there was a question around the use of interferon. So interferon beta has been tried and hopefully there's still some trials going through interferon beta, both as injectable and as inhaled, um, basically around immunomodulation. And there's some positive data, but we don't have enough to use it for treatment unless in the context of a clinical trial. Then someone asked, have we dropped as, uh, azithromycin for amoxicillin? Remember when we talked about amoxicillin, it was about treating community acquired pneumonia. We are targeting uh, bacterial causes of community acquired pneumonia. Azithromycin initially was touted as a possible treatment for COVID, probably because of its immunomodulatory um, uh, role, but we don't have any data to suggest that it should be used in COVID patients. Uh, male to female ratio compared to ASA. So in most countries, the male to female ratio is about two to one. In South Africa, the females were more than the males. And some of the suggestions put forward were probably the very high rate of uh, obesity in females. But with, I think this is one of those areas where there'll be many postulates for years to come as to why males are affected more than females. So we'll continue to watch that space closely. Then um, uh, the other question was around, what is Uganda? about what is Uganda doing differently? Um, truth is, I'm not very sure. I think one of the things is that they instituted a very strict lockdown. Their dusk to dawn care curfew is very strictly um, implemented uh, to the point that there's been complaints around police brutality and the rest. And maybe just because they've been very strict in implementing some of their mitigation measures, they've done a lot better than us. I'm not sure about testing. so. Uh, probably if someone else has an answer amongst the panelists, they could let us know. There are a lot of questions about oxygen and whether people should buy cylinders through community pharmacies or what the conditions are. I think what we can say about this is someone is sick enough requiring oxygen. They should be in hospital, not trying to self-manage at home. We've seen patients deteriorate very rapidly to the point of requiring uh, ventilation. So at this point, I'm not sure we can advocate for anyone to do home oxygen unless you have a hospital in your home with healthcare workers who are trained. Um, Dr. Maritim, any comments? Um, okay, so as Dr. Maritim is coming on, there have been a, a few questions around testing of healthcare workers. And uh, I think the issue of uh, routine testing of healthcare workers still remains an area that's very gray. I think for now, the best thing that healthcare workers can do is to ensure they have adequate PPE. Please do not be shy about demanding adequate PPE. Do not expose yourself. If you have adequate PPE, then the need for testing is lessened. If a healthcare worker is exposed for whatever reason, then it's important that the quarantine and test at the end of that quarantine period. So don't be exposed today and rush off to test tomorrow. That test may be falsely negative. Yeah. Dr. Marit. Yeah. yeah, so um, I wanted to answer some several questions that have come up uh, on the chat box. And one of them was, uh, there was a question about whether home-based uh, guidelines for home-based isolation and care exist. And they actually exist. I think the challenge has been 
uh, with their implementation. And part of the implementation is really to assess that the patient meets the criteria, which is asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. The next thing is that they have the home environment. And then the third thing is that that home environment can be able to maintain and then they're educated on what to do while they are isolating. So the guidelines exist. If you don't have the guidelines, we should be able to share with you on email so that you can see the application. And we, we should not see a situation where home-based care uh, implementation is just an alternative that uh, patients then are left because there's nowhere to take them when they don't meet that threshold. So we need to work closely to see how to choose the right patients for home-based and to create that linkage so that when a patient uh, deteriorates, then the care can be escalated and there's a prompt evacuation to link the patient to a healthcare facility. So I think that currently remains a gap. The other question I wanted to uh, add on uh, was asked by somebody because I think some private hospitals after exposure are telling healthcare workers to continue working until they develop symptoms. The human resource for health guidelines are very, very clear. And uh, Dr. Lois has mentioned, when you have a exposure, a high risk exposure, this is a patient who came, was, uh, did not, you did not know that they had COVID and you did not have appropriate PPE. Then the guidelines are very clear. The healthcare worker, and other healthcare workers in that environment need to be quarantined for a period of 14 days while they observe for symptoms and they are tested uh, either within that period if they develop the symptoms or at the end of that uh, period. So they is, it's very clear that having healthcare worker exposure puts other patients at risk because we know there is a symptomatic transmission and the healthcare worker who is not diagnosed early can't continue to transmit the infection to other colleagues as well as to other patients under their care. So. Healthcare workers, again, have to be managed uh, appropriately. And I know this has been a gap, and there's currently a strategy partnering between uh, the private sector through Kenya Healthcare Federation and the Ministry of Health IPC team to train a significant number of healthcare workers, both in the private sector as well as the public sector, on what to exactly do uh, in the setting to reduce the risk for nosocomial transmission. Uh, for healthcare uh, workers and patients really at large. The other question I want to respond to has come up in terms of where can people go for testing in Nairobi and probably we'll work together with the team in the Nairobi Metropolitan. So the testing challenge in Nairobi is not really the lab where to send the samples to, but it's more so the basic things like do the facilities that receive patients who are persons under investigation for COVID even have the sample collection kit, the nasopharyngeal swabs and the viral transport media, which is currently a gap because that then can be a point where patients then can be swabbed because currently we have a new testing strategy that focuses on patients who have symptoms of upper respiratory tract infection or uh, lower respiratory. There's a clear uh, case definition of who are eligible, who are considered persons under investigation for COVID-19. And those are the ones that we should offer them testing and testing Delayed testing is like no testing and causes more harm than benefit. So it should be prompt uh, testing. Another concern is whether 719 uh, Safaricom number is working. And this is to reassure you that the number 719 has been working and still continues to work. Uh, the only challenge is the response because there is an afferent arm and the efferent arm. Most often when people are calling the number, they want a specific maybe to be evacuated or be to, to be directed to a facility. And we need to work to see how to activate the response arm of 719. And we'll try um, to escalate this to the higher level so that we have a, a fully functional number so that if people need to be evacuated or they need additional help, that that help can be timely and available. Uh, thank you. So uh, thank you all very much. Um, for your participation. There's still very many questions and we couldn't get to all of them, but we hope we'll uh, try to answer the most pressing questions. We'll be back next week, Friday. We hope more counties can join us. Remember for the counties, the essence is that we all improve. So it's not really about the best picture. It's telling us where you are and where you need support. So thank you all for participating. We wish you a very good weekend. Bye. Bye.